recording we are live now good morning everybody on behalf of acta mumbai i welcome you all we'll just wait for around uh, uh, half a minute so that everybody can just log in and settle down Yeah, so, so uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, so, welcome to this uh, uh, Sunday morning. It's it's very cloudy in uh, Mumbai. Uh, it's fantastic weather, and I think so. Another uh, a great lecture, educational lecture series five. Uh, so today we are going to speak on anesthesia for on pump surgeries. and to speak on this uh, we have a faculty i uh, all the three faculty do not require any introduction but i will just introduce to speak we have first dr deepa kane madam so she is a professor in anesthesia uh, at the said gs medical college and km hospital mumbai and her interest are cardiac anesthesia and regional anesthesia and also we have dr the uh, doctor uh, to moderate this session we have dr kalpana shah welcome madam so she is a cardiac anesthesiologist in private practice since the last 30 years a lot of experience she is also an ex kmit she she did her anesthesia from say gs medical college and km hospital and her special interest are uh, of pump coronary artery bypass surgery and uh, fast tracking of patients and she is the first to regularly use the laryngeal mask airway uh, in of pump coronary artery bypass surgery a paper has been published and to also speak on the trans esophageal echo considerations we have dr deepak gode who is joining us from aurangabad he is a part of the ozone anesthesia group and he has lots of experience in cardiac anesthesia almost 12 he is a consultant with almost uh, 15 national papers and 16 and six international papers published and a number of guest lectures also delivered his special interest are risk stratification in cardiac anesthesia and point of care ultrasound and his special achievement is that he has been a winner of the janak mehta paper awards aikta in 2013 14 and 16 he is on the editorial board of the ans of cardiac anesthesia and also the guest reviewer of jcv so welcome dr bode so welcome all the three of you and i request now dr deepakane madam to share the screen and we can start off with the lecture So good morning, everybody, and uh, thank you for being here on a Sunday morning. Uh, I am going to touch on anesthetic considerations for on pump CABG. Now, Dr. Rajeshri Agaskar has talked in detail last time about the anatomy. I am going to just show some pictures, and uh, we will touch on areas which she has not touched. She has spoken about of pump CABG last time we had a lecture series. the pathophysiology the chronic in, everybody is aware about this chronic inflammation plaque uh, lipid plaque formation plaque rupture vasoactive substances being released from platelets and leukocytes and which further decreases the cerebral blood flow just going into the historical uh, perspectives of the cabg it was winberg who first implanted the internal thoracic artery directly into the myocardium as early as 1951 and it was in cleveland that the first septic vein graft was taken in 67 then anastomosis of the ima directly to the coronary artery happened as early as 1968 in 90 started the enhanced recovery the fast tracking and then transesophageal was added it was a important clinical development if we look at the mortality isolated cabg itself as 2% mortality when cabg is done along with the mitral valve replacement the mortality goes up to 8.3% and when it, the cabg is associated with the aortic surgery depending on whether it's ascending aorta or the arch or the descending aorta the mortality just goes up Now another perioperative care of a CABG patient is a teamwork of so many people: the anesthetist, intensivist, perfusionist, the surgeon, and the cardiologist. 
Indications of CABG, unstable angina pectoris, persistent angina pectoris, despite optimal medical therapy, prince mental angina, high-grade left main coronary artery obstruction, double or triple vessel disease with proximal LAD obstruction. There's a class one recommendation for CABG that is coronary anatomy not amenable to PCI or ongoing or recurrent ischemia or cardiogenic shock. For emergency CABG, patients with STEMI, class 1 recommendation for emergency CABG in patients having a VSD following myocardial infarction, papillary muscle rupture, or a free wall rupture. Indications for emergency CABG after a failed PCI are ongoing ischemia or threatened occlusion with substantial myocardium at risk hemodynamic compromise without impairment of coagulation and without previous sternotomy, class one recommendation, and retrieval of a foreign body like fractured guide wire stent in a crucial lo uh, location, class two recommendation. What are the goals of pre-anesthetic evaluation? We have to review history in detail and examine patients in detail, look at the investigations, both cardiac and non-cardiac, risk stratify the patient, and along with the surgeon, plan the perioperative period of the patient and do everything to alleviate patient's anxiety. When you go to look at the patient, you have to look from small basic things like the venous excess, whether it's going to be difficult. So you have many a times obese patients or patients where the veins are pricked many times and starting with the venous excess itself may be difficult. Today, ultrasound is helping us a lot right from venous, the peripheral excess to the arterial excess to the central venous excess. For the arterial line, you know, the Allen's test is important. And when you look at the arteries, not only look at the radial arteries, look at the arteries from top to down, the carotid arteries, the most important carotid artery. If you have a buoy there, you know, you have to think of even the Doppler of the carotids, whether it's already done, if it's not done, you have to ask for it. Look for the peripheral vessels, peripheral vascular disease may be present in the patient. And uh, in diabetics, diabetic vasculopathy, cellulitis, if it is there, bring it to the notice of the surgeon. If you are going to use the TEE, if the patient has swallowing problems, history of esophageal lesions, any surgery done on the esophagus, hiatus hernia, and you know, airway is most important. Many of the CAPG patients have a big BMI, high index, and also big jaws, difficult airways. You have to keep the right gadgets ready. A McCoy, a gum elastic, which Gucci, uh, indirect laryngoscopy, the CMAC makes the airway easy. Coming to the cardiovascular risk factor, what is the state of myocardial ischemia in this patient? What is the ventricular function in this patient? Has this patient been in heart failure? Is it in failure right now? How are the valves? This is all you're going to look at, the arteriosclerotal disease of the carotid arteries, whether the surgeon wants to do CABG with the carotid and wrap endartrectomy because significant carotid stenosis at about 80 percent is present in 4 to 10 percent of patients undergoing CABG. Proximal aorta also is very important. It's going to do the aortic cannulation, whether there's calcification there, you can look at, at it at the chest x-ray later on. Dr. Bode will tell in details about the T and uh, whether there is concomitant pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension itself, with pressures more than 25, increases mortality and morbidity. The non-cardiac risk factor, the gender, the age, diabetes, hypertension, smoking, COPD, obstructive sleep apnea, thyroid dysfunction also important. Optimization of all these factors is important. Anemia, a lot of importance is given to anemia. If the patient has iron deficiency anemia, if there is time for surgery, oral iron will help. If there's no time, IV iron. CKD patients may have low iron, whether we need to give erythropoietin, CKD patients undergoing dialysis, non-dialysis, the protocols are different. So anemia is very important nowadays because it's not only about oxygen carrying capacity of blood, but if you can get the HD up to about 13, there's a chance that the patient will leave the hospital without a blood transfusion also increases. Nutrition, a lot of importance given to nutrition because they have seen even with malnutrition, it's difficult sometimes for patients to come up bypass. Frailty, there are frailty indices, you know, patients looking very 
frail may not get discharged like other patients who are robust. And not only if, if they get discharged, they may come back for readmission. And in this COVID era, RT-PCR in the last 72 hours becomes important. What about the surgical risk factors? What type of surgery is it? Emergency or elective? The complexity of the surgery? Is it a redo a combined with CABG with carotid uh, endarterectomy or CABG with mitral valve repair or valve replacement? What is it? How much are you expecting to be the duration of the CP bypass time? How much would be the clamp time? What is the experience of the institute and the team? And what is the infrastructure of the hospital? Everything determines the outcomes. In fact, there are studies where they determine how one surgeon is better than the other cardiac surgeon or one hospital better than the other because they have a ratio, the OE ratio, the observed versus the expected. What is observed after putting in all the parameters? What is the expected mortality and what is the surgeon giving or what is the institute given? Decides whether the institute is good, not so good, etc. So there are different scores defined as the Euro score, which is by the European Society. And depending on the score, you have low risk, intermediate risk, or high risk. They take into consideration so many factors, the age, sex, the EF of the patient, the renal dysfunction, peripheral vascular disease, respiratory disease, previous cardiac surgery, endocarditis, unstable angina. There are points for everything. And the, after the points, they will say the patient is either low risk or high risk. The STS score, that is the surgery, thoracic uh, surgery score, there are, again, this is this app is available on net. Anybody can open it and you can put in all the parameters and you can give an idea of the risk of mortality, risk of renal failure, stroke, everything. It gives you more or less an idea. And also this is a big database. So everything is entered in. Again, there is uh, different variables which are calculated and just freely available on the net. The syntax score is another score which guides the treatment of the patient, whether it is PCI or CABG. The lower scores definitely go for um, PCI and the higher scores definitely go for CABG and the scores in between, they can go for PCI or CABG. They basically uh, look at the angiography findings and all the complexity of the lesions which are blocked more and how many are blocked, et cetera, et cetera. Again, this is available online and. So in, uh, simply if we look at a chronic stable angina would be a low risk and acute MI patient who is hemodynamically stable comes under intermediate risk and an acute MI patient who is hemodynamically unstable would come under high risk. Uh, just looking at the conduits, you should know, have an idea what conduits the surgeon is going to use. Okay, so you have different conduits, the radial artery, ulnar artery. Now the most commonly used, sorry, is the internal thoracic artery, the cephalus vein grafts, and the radial artery. The ulnar artery, right, right gastroepiploic artery, inferior gastric splenic are less commonly used. Now, if you see, most of the surgeons like to use this internal thoracic artery. DEMA to LAD is the most common thing done because it's very reliable. It's most effective. If you look at the morphology and the histological features of this artery, it makes it free of atherosclerosis as well as intimal hyperplasia. That means in the long term, this artery will serve the patient better. The elasticity, if you see, the elasticity-wise, it is much better than the other artery. In fact, they have found that the lima is even elasticity-wise better than the rima. Radial artery, it's a versatile graft. It gives a vast length to reach distal coronary branches. Multiple anastomosis can be done. Even the internal thoracic artery, multiple anastomosis can be done. It is a, a big artery and it makes it comfortable for the surgeon to handle an anastomosis. The diameter is comparable to a coronary artery. It, is, uh, it has ability to add up to high pressures. Removal is safe and easy. It's, uh, it's a good artery. Only disadvantage is that it is prone to early spasms because it is highly muscular. Now in this COVID era, I thought we should just touch on this. Like if you have a post-COVID patient coming to you, this is for any surgery, in fact, a post-COVID patient coming should wait ideally for four weeks 
if, if the patient was asymptomatic when we had the COVID, should wait for six weeks if the patient had mild symptoms like cough dyspnea but did not require hospitalization. If the patient was symptomatic at that time and was diabetic, immunocompromised, hospitalized, ideally we should wait for eight to 10 weeks. And 12 weeks is for a patient who should be at who was admitted to the ICU due to COVID-19 infections. This, I think they have extrapolated this uh, information after the H1N1 experience. We have to know about this long COVID that a patient may be free of uh, COVID. That means he becomes negative, but the symptoms continue for weeks or months and multiple organs may be involved. So lung, heart, kidney, brain, and we have to look at the these organs in more detail if we have a post-COVID case. Also, post-traumatic stress disorder is common and um, looking at the psychological well-being of the patient is a part of rehabilitation. Post-COVID mucormycosis, you know, the mortality is very high. The eyes, the you know, brain, pulmonary, these are the areas which may be involved. So this fungal infection, if it is there, it needs to be treated. Coming back to investigations, which we'll do for CABG, the complete hemogram, the glycosylated hemoglobin, FPS, PLPS, ECG, stress test, echo, angio, X-ray test, LFTs, RFTs, electrolyte, thyroid profile, and a baseline ABG. And as per the case, we will have specific investigations like you have bad lungs, you want to see lungs in more detail, the PFD, the DLCO, you have a sleep apnea case, you want sleep studies, et cetera, et cetera. So this Dr. Rajeshri has told in detail last time about the uh, vessel involvement and the uh, uh, which wall and which uh, uh, ECG leads are affected. So you should have a fair idea of this. I think most of you know this inferior wall to three AVF, lateral wall lead one AVL, B4 to B6, enteroceptal, enterolateral. You get an idea looking at the leads and which vessel are CA to three AVF, so complex. Uh, lead 1 ABL, LAT, V3 to V5. What about the pre op drug? Most of these patients will be on beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, statins. All these need to, con to be continued till the morning of surgery. Aspirin also is continued nowadays till morning of surgery, but it is patient specific. Clopidogrel can be stopped five days prior to surgery, prasugrel seven days. And in case of an emergency, there is no time to stop. If, if the surgeon can wait for about 24 hours, the patient would have less bleeding, but it all depends on the case. AC inhibitors should be stopped ideally 24 to 36 hours prior to surgery. If they are continued, it is seen that while coming off bypass, the inotropic support requirement goes up. About diuretics, there is no strict recommendation as such, but you make sure your potassium is normal. If you have hypokalemia, you keep hypomagnesemia also in mind. If the patient has received a low molecular weight heparin, should be ideally stopped 12 hours prior to surgery. Antibiotics ideally should go with your first IV line 20 to 60 minutes before the incision, the antibiotic has to be in as per your hospital protocol. I'll talk a little bit about the thoracic epidurals because if you need to put a thoracic epidural, ideally it should go one day prior or at least four hours prior to giving heparin. Uh, the, you can follow the ASTRA guidelines for that. So uh, how does it help? The acute transitory cardiac sympathectomy is caused by a high thoracic epidural. It improves coronary flow, improves the balance between oxygen delivery and consumption, and improves flow to the internal thoracic artery, attenuates the ventricular dysfunction. They have found even decrease in the BNP levels and the troponin levels in patients who have received a, a thoracic epidural. But the big question is about the epidural hematoma and most of us uh, are not for it because of the fear of this epidural hematoma and the insertion and the removal of catheters. You have to be very careful and especially with the newer oral anticoagulants used, you have to take extra care that you're following guidelines and the patient doesn't have any symptoms of an hematoma. Still, there are many meta-analyses which are published regarding thoracic epidural versus GA, and they have found the thoracic epidural was associated with significantly reduced mortality at the long longest available follow-up in this uh, uh, in this study. And the estimated risk of epidural hematoma is one in three thousand five fifty-two. This is by Langoni et al. 
Again, in a, another bigger study of 4,860 patients who were in 2019 published comparative study of thoracic epidural versus IV analgesia or a nerve block or an intracular analgesia or wound infiltration. These are all other methods of pain relief. And they found there is no difference in 30-day mortality or rate of perioperative stroke or incidence of post-op pneumonia, but they did find reduced risk of respiratory depression, shorter time to extubation, and reduced risk of post-operative atrial fibrillation. In this study, there was no epidural hematoma, however, reported. Now, the newer block is the ESP, that the erector spinae block. It, was, uh, it is a very new block. It is first introduced, I think, around 2016. And our own people from Jayadeva, Dr. Nagaraja and Dr. Raghavendra have studied this. And it is published in Annals of Cardiac Anesthesia. They compared the continuous thoracic epidural with bilateral erector spinae block for perioperative pain management. And they have also introduced the catheters day prior to the surgery. And what did they find? That ESP block had a comparable pain score with thoracic epidural and hence proved to be an effective alternative to thoracic epidural in adult cardiac surgery for period pain management and for fast tracking. Since it is a very easy block and my interest is also regional, I thought I'd issue the ultrasound scans, which this is from their article. And if you keep your probe just lateral to the spine and you go and start looking at the um, uh, transverse processes, Manoj Karmatkar et al. have called this the tritial sign. And uh, once you get this thoracic, uh, this transverse processing, the erector spinae muscle here, in between the erector spinae and the transverse process in the spatial plane, local anesthetic is deposited and a catheter is put. Only thing you have to put bilaterally. And they have used 15 ml initially and followed by continuous infusion point. 1-5% bupivacaine at rate of 0.1 ml per page per minute for about 48 hours. Again, with these catheters, you can add your elastomeric disposable pumps and the you know, continuous infusions can go on for 48 hours for pain relief. Coming to the pre-medication, nowadays most commonly we are using midazolam 0.05 mg per kg of 1-2 to mic. It's 0 0.02 to 0 0.05, fentanyl 1-2 to 2 mic per Kg. And whenever you give pre medication, you need to supplement oxygen and you're giving in a case of IHD. And uh, during your intravenous IV cannulation, arterial cannulation, if the patient is not well sedated, you can see the Ramsey sedation scale. And if you feel you need to add some more sedation, that is the time to add and make sure you give your antibiotic at that time. Now, for induction, we use drugs like etomidate, propofol. All of us use uh, this commonly, fentanyl, medicinal, and neuromuscular blocking used uh, rocuronium and cisetracurium. Gone are other days when we used high doses of opioids with penturonium. There was a time for years we have used high doses fentanyl with penturonium because it counteracted the so fentanyl would produce a little bit of bradyl and penturonium, a little bit of khaki at the end would have a good heart rate of about 60 to 80 per minute. That is a whole story now. Now we have come to low doses of fentanyl. Now, uh, lots of this, I think we had another series by Dr. Umbarkar and uh, Dr. Gande was speaking on this PAC catheter. I'm not going to say much about it, but uh, yeah. oh, the olden time we used to have that advanced venous excess with a nice sheet which we used to keep in and we used to float the catheter as and when required. Not all patients received it, but the low EF cases and sometimes it's also it's teamwork which is the surgeon and you together deciding whether you need to put the PSC. The yeah, good thing about the PSC is that the, the patient continues to have the PSC in the post-operative period. So your Monitoring goes on. Now with TE, PAC is not required at all, but what happens to post-op time? So there are some advantages and some disadvantages of everything. So I won't discuss this in more detail. What about the monitoring? The ECG, the B B5 uh, lead most sensitive for ischemia, lead to further monitoring and inferior wall ischemia, oxygen saturations, ETCO2. About the invasive BP, 
usually we would cannulate the uh, to start with we will start with the radial artery but uh, our protocol had, had been to uh, put in the femoral artery uh, because it not only permits access to the central artery arterial tree and that is important while coming of bypass sometimes the radial artery is damped or when they are retracting on the sternal you get the pressures are damped and if you have a femoral artery line you're getting a continuous trace and also you have an access to a quick insert of IABP. If you have the PAC and the continue, uh, cardiac output monitoring along with that, you get all other parameters, the cardiac index, SPR, PVR, SPO2, and you keep the hemodynamic uh, stability. TEE, uh, initial comprehensive pre-bypass TEE, followed by continuous use uh, for monitoring of ischemia as well as monitoring the ventricular fun function and volume. Dr. Deepak Bode will speak in detail about TEE. NERS is for the cerebral oximetry. BIS, this is for the depth of anesthesia. A lot of studies on BIS versus agent monitoring for depth of anesthesia. And the recall time usually is the rewarming time when there is recall. One thing is for sure, if you use too much of volatile anesthetics, post-op cognitive dysfunction is moved. So it's good to have an, some form of monitoring so that you use the right amount of uh, volatile anesthetics or any anesthetic that you're using. Temperature monitoring, both nasopharyngeal as well as uh, the, the rectal temperature monitoring, urine output, ABG, hemoglobin, electrolytes, calcium, glucose, and the ACT monitoring and coagulation test. We have not given you the full checklist pre-bypass, on-bypass, and post-bypass, considering you have already familiar with all this, and that may come again on our educational series on bypass. Now, in the pre-bypass period, we are talking more about the CAPG in the pre-bypass period. Uh, and uh, of course, this is common to all that after induction and intubation, when the surgeon is busy preparing and draping the everything is quiet, but you may have few periods of hypotension and you have to either need fluid or you have to keep your phenylephrine boluses ready. The skin incision, the sternotomy time, you may have a little bit of tachycardia hypertension. So you have to make sure your anesthesia depth is more at the incision time or the sternotomy time. And uh, so you have to anticipate and increase on your anesthesia depth and uh, keep the patient hemodynamic stable. Again, in a deeply anesthetized patient, when the chest is opened, due to decrease venous return, the, uh, what happens is that negative intracorous pressure that draws the blood into the chest is lost and you may have a little bit of hypotension at that time. Again, a little bit of blood volume, a little bit of phenylephrine will bring up the pressures. Sternal retraction can cause a little bit of bradycardia and your pain has to be ready. And when the patients, um, you know, when the sternal retractors are put, the patient's head moves up a little and especially old patients with cervical spondylitis and all. you may need additional pillows, but you should take care of these small minor things. Now, uh, uh, the anesthetic management is all about maintaining the hemodynamics and I have to point out to you, antifibrinolytics in the olden days, we believed in using a lot of eprotonin. It would be a crime not to use uh, eprotonin in the olden days, but with the BART trial, it's around 2007, we stopped using a protein and from that time it is tranexamic acid. Now in the BART trial, I would just like to remind you that BART trial, uh, there was a premature stopping of that trial because they found that the mortality is quite high with the protein versus tranexamic and they also found kidney dysfunction. So in fact, they uh, the FDA gave a black box warning to the company and they had to withdraw a protein from the market around 2007. After that, it was all tranexamic acid. Now, heparin, when we give for an uh, for CABG patients, you uh, preferably give it before clamping of the lima pedicle. Now, when the lima uh, harvesting is going on, you have to maintain a little low tidal volume, otherwise it will come in the way of the surgeon, and no peep to be given. So when you give low tidal volume, you need to increase on the respiratory rate, you have to maintain your CO2 and your ABGs. Now, the surgeon may use papaverine a little and may produce a little bit of hypotension just to avoid coronary spasm, to avoid the artery spasm, you may use a little bit of papaverine. As in other cases, going on bypass, we use 300 to 400 units per kg and maintain the ACT. In 
when you have a patient with severe atherosclerosis, you remember that this patient will have atherosclerosis in all the vessels. So what about the cerebral vessels? What about the kidney vessels? What, so you have to take care that you keep the map a little higher in this patient. So baseline is very important. So don't uh, go try to decrease map less than 20, 15 to 20% from the baseline. That should take care of perfusion of all vital organs and provide, think of providing adequate pain relief in the post op period. Coming to opioids from the old era of uh, uh, high-dose opioids, they have come to the low-dose opioids and they have found that they do a pretty good job. Now about anesthetic preconditioning and volatile anesthetics, you know, anesthetic uh, preconditioning is well known with volatile agents with modulation of G protein and activation of protein C kinase. All exam going students should know this stuff well because it's very impressive to say this production of reactive oxygen species and increased activity of mitochondrial ATP potassium channels and stimulates the sarcolemma and the mitochondrial ATP sensitive potassium channels and regulation of apoptosis gene expression, inhibition of activity of mitochondrial permeability. All these things are very impressive. Now, so much was said about this uh, preconditioning and inhalational agents that in 2017, the European Association for Cardiothoracic Surgery in its guideline recommended that volatile anesthetics should be included in the anesthesia plan for CFG and there was a class one recommendation for that. But what happened in 2019, the Myriad study, they involved 5,400 patients from 36 centers in 13 countries undergoing on-pump CABG and off-pump CABG and compared anesthetic regime that included a volatile anesthetic with a total intravenous. And the final conclusion was that volatile anesthetics are not a magic bullet. So Landoni et al. In, his, in this study said there's no significant difference in one year mortality. There's no significant difference when it comes to secondary endpoints like 30 day mortality, ICU stay, hospital length of stay. So that is the last trial that came out that is 2019. Now, what about halogenated anesthetic agents and cerebral protective? They don't only really have cardio protective, they have cerebral protective agents effects and this Chen et al. So many meta-analysis and RCTs they have, with the um, um, mini mental score index if they have seen then they have seen that OCD, the uh, CPD also and uh, the you know, mini mental scores and the S uh, scores are better and this S100B levels are seen to be lower in halogenated groups. That means the volatile anesthetics are better as far as cerebral protection group goes. See, S100 deep uh, is important. These blood co uh, concentrations are seen to increase with ischemic stroke or traumatic brain injury. And post-operative uh, uh, post levels are regarded as early markers of brain injury and neurological injury. How about xenon anesthesia? We don't have it in India, but in an RCT, they have said that uh, uh, L. Tim, uh, Timmy et al. He found reduced risk of post-operative delirium in patients receiving the xenon compared to seroflurane. Now, what about the ventilation strategy? The low tidal volume, less than 8 ml per kg, uh, peak inspiratory pressure minus the peak less than 16 and maintaining peak about 5 is associated with reduced risk of post-op pulmonary complications. Now, what all is monitoring going on uh, on for a CABG? One is the ECG, one is the TEE. The other is the elevations in the right or the left ventricular filling pressures. The CPT or the, if you have the PA catheter, the wet pressures. The increase means it indicates ischemia. Now, uh, blood pressures, I told you, you should maintain 15 to 20% from the baseline and normal heart rate will like to maintain 50 to 80 per minute. If there is tachycardia with hypotension, you may need to give two boluses of fluid and a little bit of phenylephrine. If there's tachycardia and hypertension, first think of the anesthetic depth, increase on the anesthetic depth. It doesn't work, that means a beta blocker and an NTG will help. Now, NTG, what is the use of NTG in a CABG? Hypertension, you can bring down the pressures, you can bring down the pulmonary artery pressures. If there's a new onset ACV, is, that is, uh, it, it may suggest ischemic MR, acute ischemia, ST changes, new regional wall motion abnormalities on POE. 
diastolic dysfunction, systolic dysfunction, coronary artery spasm, with this intra of use of NTG. Long time back, we used a lot of nicorandil. I don't know. Presently, it's not much, it's not in use, but uh, we used to use a lot of nicorandil some years back for all these reasons. About the plagia in a CABG, it is enterograde plus retrograde. You know, enterograde plagia is put at, into the coronary artery, which is at the arterial level, arter from the arterial side. Now, in patients who have blocked coronaries, for for the plagia to go on the other side of the block. It may not be possible and the myocardial preservation may not be good. Again, in patients we have uh, who have uh, LV, which is hypertrophic, the plagia which you're giving from arterial side may not re reach the whole of the myocardium. So it is important that we put plagia of also retrogradely from the coronary sinus. So when you give from the arterial side as well as the venous side, we are more sure of myocardial preservation. And myocardial preservation is the key to good outcomes for coming off bypass. So there are different trials done on what should be the uh, ventilation or oxygenation when patient is on bypass. You know, the oxygenator is doing the job, but what about the lungs of the patient? So do, there is no ventilation versus maintaining a small amount of CPAP. There's no ventilation versus maintaining a low FIO. So there are different trials going on. There are ongoing trials. The CPP vent trial, the Meccano trial, and the one CPP trial. These are not that conclusive. But some of most of us like to put oxygen off and some would keep a very low dose of oxygen just to keep the oxygen, the lungs open. Now, the while coming off bypass, you may have low cardiac output for various reasons. You may have an LV dysfunction, you may have an RV dysfunction, or you may have a diastolic dysfunction, which is heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, or you may have pulmonary hypertension, you can have valve dysfunction or respiratory failure. Now, Dr. Bode will speak more in detail about all these dysfunctions and what inotropes we use to take care of all these issues. Now, what are the predictors for this low cardiac output? Preoperatively, you have age more than 65, LVEF less than 50%, on pump, CAPG, uh, malnutrition, diabetes, CKDs, intra factors like CPP duration is more or it's for emergency surgery or lab predictors like pro BNP is high. All these factors may be associated with low cardiac output. Another important component is the tri uh, triiodothyronine levels. The 334 has to be normal for the patient. Whenever it is less, it is found that coming off bypass becomes difficult. It's a strong predictor of a low cardiac output syndrome and even death in CABG patients. In fact, there was a study done by Melissa Jansen, and it is profilically giving triiodothyronine after removal of the clamp versus a placebo, and he has found that patients who have received triiodothyronine, their cardiac index is much better. They need low, lower amount of inotropes. Now, what about the GI potassium, which we all give? It can be used as an adjunct therapy to treat post-surgical uh, low cardiac output without serious adverse events. Now, when you're coming off bypass, you may have a lot of arrhythmias during rewarming, the reperfusion injury. Uh, you can have ventricular fibrillation, you can have VTAC. VTAC non-sustained is usually benign. If it is a sustained type, monomorphic or poly polymorphic, which will occur only in one to three percent of uh, patients, it is not so good. The mortality is high. Atrial fibrillation, 15 to 40 percent of patients undergoing CAVG will have atrial fibrillation. And if it the CABG valve, then atrial fibrillation chances go up to 60%. And atrial fibrillation usually is self limited without a prior history of AFib, it will be self limited. If they had AFib in the past, what drugs they were on, the same drugs have to continue. And it will revert to sinus rhythm usually within 24 hours if the patient did not have AFib in the past and by six to eight weeks in 90% of the patients. Now, this I have got from the uh, uh, journal uh, Cardiothoracic and Vascular Anesthesia, uh, Lomi Vorto Vetal. I could not fit in the reference here. But uh, the whole thing about uh, ischemia is oxygen delivery and oxygen consumption. So, if we look at oxygen delivery, 
uh, what is important for the anesthetist is the hemoglobin concentration. So you should know that transfusion trigger that the patient is bleeding for whatever uh, reason, the blood saving, uh, blood conservation strategies, Tranexa, we have already talked about. Oxygenation of the patient, the respiratory support and the oxygen, uh, additional oxygen of the patient. The cardiovascular, that's the cardiac output, depends on the preload, the afterload, and the contractility. Preload, your fluids are important, and fluid re removal is also important on bypass, diuretics, ultrafiltration, and restrictive fluid therapy. Afterload, the uh, vasopressors and vasodilators, the regional anesthesia, and IAPP all contribute to the afterload. The contractility, again, inotropes and the beta blockers that you have used, the heart rate and the rhythm, whether the patient needs spacing or antiarrhythmics, and the valve function, all will uh, decide, all this will decide the oxygen delivery of the patient. Now, what about the oxygen consumption of the patient? Oxygen consumption, we'll look at the microcirculation micro and the oxygen utilization of the patient. Uh, oxygen utilization at cell level, the mitochondrial level, what is happening is, the, if there is too much of tissue edema, I remember many years back when bypass times used to be even four or five hours, the patient used to come out very edematous. Today, we, last 10 years, we don't have the problem because of ultrafiltration. So, sorry. So, uh, uh, so this, this tissue edema should not be allowed and um, uh, you have to tackle these, uh, even the cytokines and all these inflammatory mediators, interleukins, if you can take out to the ultrafiltration, that also will help in the oxygen utilization. That is the mitochondrial function of the cell has to be maintained. Otherwise, it becomes anaerobic metabolism at the cell level. What about the microcirculation? The microvascular pressure, again, edema causes a lot of fluid edema causes this microvascular pressure. Microcirculatory recruitment with vasodilators and rheology, the anticoagulants, everything will help in the microcirculation. So on one hand, you had oxygen delivery and on one hand, you have oxygen consumption. If you can maintain this balance, then you're doing a good job. Otherwise, there will be a tilt and there will be ischemia. I think with this, I hand over uh, to uh, Dr. Deepak Bode. Uh, he will talk about the TEE in detail and when we are coming off the inotropes that you have to use. And then I will come back to tell the complications. Thank you. Thank you. Over to Dr. Deepak Bode. Yeah, you can answer. Yeah. Deepak, you can share your screen. Yeah, is the screen visible now? Yeah, yeah, Deepak. Yeah. So, good morning and thank you very much, Acta Mumbai, for giving me this opportunity to share uh, some of my experience on T in CABG. Uh, this will no way be a very extensive or very comprehensive uh, uh, view, but I'll just try to be as practical and as focused as much possible. So, before we begin, uh, I would like to give advice to younger generation who are now very well versed with transesophageal echo. Uh, the two main advices are always, always store your images with the patient details in it. So that will help you to compare after coming off bypass and to compare with your previous, uh, you know, previous images. So as you go on doing transesophageal echo more and more commonly, uh, you will sort of gain experience in it and you will become mature. So you know your quality improvement is very important. And second important advice that I can give you is always discuss whatever you feel is significant with the surgeon. So that applies even if you are the junior most anesthesiologist and the surgeon is senior most. Still, you always discuss with the surgeon. So that will help you in the quality improvement and that will gain the confidence of the surgeon. So next time in a trouble situation, surgeon will call you and that's how you, you know, build up the team. So you always give something, the feedback to the surgeon that will be useful for him. Coming to TE proper now. So uh, when, when we do transesophageal echo, commonest questions that will be asked to you, whether LV is dilated or not, LV is hypertrophied or not, and what is the LV systolic function? 
so to say whether the lv is dilated or not we usually go in the transgastric two chamber view and we see uh, we we measure the diameter just at the uh, at the insertion of the papillary muscles so on the left side of the lower screen you can see a 37 mm lv which appears fairly normal and on the right side 57 mm lv which is definitely dilated so the reference ranges for male and female are different roughly for female it is 40 to 50 and for the male it is 45 to 60 to say whether lv is hypertrophied or not because as madam kane has told that uh, if a concentric concentric lvh is there so myocardial preservation can be difficult and you have to help the surgical team with that to say whether the lv is hypertrophied or not you measure the posterior wall thickness at 1 o'clock in the uh, mid papillary view transgastric mid papillary view at 1 o'clock position you have to measure the posterior wall thickness and at say 9 o'clock position you have to measure a uh, septal wall thickness so here on the left side lower image you can see 7 and 8 mm of the uh, diameters which appear uh, thickness which appear normal and on the right side of the screen uh, 12 and 11 mm uh, thickness which is a hypertrophy again for male and female the diameters uh, vary for a female uh, less than 9 mm is considered as normal anything above 9 is abnormal and for male 10 mm is the cutoff limit so another uh, commonest question that can be asked uh, is what is the systolic function of the heart so systolic function of the heart uh, can be uh, by various uh, parameters and the commonest m mode parameter is fractional shortening the fractional shortening is uh, obtained again in the transgastric mid papillary view by m mode and fractional shortening above 30% is considered as normal. Here you can see a mid papillary view and you put an M mode and you measure the end diastolic and end systolic uh, diameters and uh, fractional shortening here is 38, which is quite normal. And in another, in contrast, this patient has got fractional shortening only of 21%. So in addition to fractional shortening, this M mode gives you excellent temporal resolution and the uh, LV wall, which is on the top, is the inferior wall. And you can see very less excursion of the inferior wall here. In contrast, in the anterior wall, there is, uh, there is a lot of good excursion. Say, uh, to give you clue that inferior wall is hypokinetic. Another, uh, another M mode parameter which can be used is the MAPSE. Uh, I'm very sorry, I forgot to put that slide. We, our group itself has uh, published in JCVA that screening of the uh, LV systolic function by this mitral annular plane systolic excursion can be useful uh, for assessment of ejection fraction. So another parameter which can give you an idea is fractional area change, which is again measured in the mid uh, transgastric mid papillary view. You have to trace the endocardial border at the end diastole and end systole. And if a value more than 45% will say that LV function, systolic function is normal. Here in this case, it is 50%. And in contrast, this patient has got fractional area change of only 25%. So as uh, Dr. Karne Madam was saying, you have to anticipate a successful weaning from a cardiopulmonary bypass will definitely depend on your preparedness in the pre-cardiopulmonary bypass period. So if you can tell the surgeon or if you are, can alert the team that this patient has got LV, severe LV dysfunction, probably he will need inotropic support or probably while coming off bypass, patient may need a balloon pump. So you have, that's, how you can, uh, that's how you can improve the communication. The ejection fraction is the percentage of LV diastolic volume that is ejected during systole that can be obtained by calculating end systolic and end diastolic volume. All of you should know this formula in percentage. So the commonest method and the most uh, recommended method is the modified Simpson. That is method of disc. The LV cavity is divided into 20 discs uh, when you trace the endocardial border. And most of the modern machines will automatically give you the volume and they will give you the ejection fraction. They can, uh, you can always obtain a, a stroke volume uh, from these uh, parameters. And if you multiply 
the stroke volume with your heart rate, you can easily get cardiac output. So uh, particularly you have to measure this serially, like just before sternotomy, after sternotomy, and when you are trying to come off bypass. So this can give you again an idea about uh, inotropic support. If the patient has got very dilated left ventricle and uh, you feel that ejection fraction is very low, and if you document that, then probably inotrope of choice can be adrenaline. If the patient is very hypovolemic or if having a distributive kind of uh, low uh, cardiac output syndrome, then noradrenaline can be your inotrope of choice. So when you calculate the ejection fraction by transesophageal echo, one of the most troublesome thing can be foreshortening. Here in this case, if you see the ejection fraction in mid-esophageal four chamber view, I have calculated as 56%. But you can see in the end systolic frame here, you can very well say that this is a foreshortening. So this may give you a falsely high, uh, high uh, value. So you should be very well aware about this uh, caveat of foreshortening as far as T is concerned. In contrast, this looks quite good tracing and you always have to check it in four chamber and two chamber view. And if the difference between the four chamber and two chamber view is not very high, then uh, you can say that there is not much of foreshortening. So this patient, again, as you can see, is quite a dilated left ventricle. The end diastolic volume and end systolic volume gives you a, a ejection fraction of 27%. And you can, as you can see here, the stroke volume is only 28. And you get an uh, idea about the heart rate, just looking at the trace of the ECG. In this case, the uh, heart rate must be between 70 to 80. And if you just multiply, you get a cardiac output. So when we are dealing with a CABG patient, uh, we have to know the TE T has got a role as far as the ischemic complications are concerned. They can be segmental dysfunction, which we I will just tell you in a while. We have discussed about LV dilatation. Ischemic MR is one of the most important parameter that you need to assess. And that will, uh, that will uh, not only give you an idea about the short term, but even the long term prognosis of the CABG patient, papillary muscle dysfunction, whether there is any thrombus, whether there is any aneurysm, or whether there is any ventricular septal rupture. So, coming to segmental function, uh, we all should know, uh, particularly the fellows should all know about the 17 segment LV model, in which the LV is divided into three. Uh, segments, the basal segment, where you see the mitral valve, the mid papillary section, where the papillary muscles are seen, the anterolateral and posteromedial, the apical segment are four in number, while basal and mid are six in number, and the last segment is the apical cap. So you always have one method in your mind, like I, I for my convenience, I usually start with the anterior segment, anterior, then anteroseptal, inferoseptal, inferior, inferolateral, and anterolateral. So you, there, there is no rocket science in it. You can do whichever way you want. The segment which is just next to the your uh, transesophageal echo probe is the inferior, and the far away segment is anterior. That is how you, you have to first remember, and then you can uh, assess whichever way you want. Okay, The anterior and the anteroseptal segment is usually supplied by the left anterior descending and the diagonal arteries. The uh, inferocept uh, inferoseptal and inferior is usually by the right coronary artery, while the lateral segments are usually supplied by the circumflex artery. Similar to the ECG uh, segmental analysis, which Madam Carney had told, so this can uh, help you in identifying which segment is having uh, regional wall motion abnormality. And you have to see it at base, mid, and apical level. Okay, so the mid papillary we gives you idea about all the three uh, important arteries. But if you are looking at the four chamber view, this is anterolateral and inferoseptal. So you have to know which view you are obtaining and correspondingly you should know. So this figure is very important. The two chamber view will give you idea about anterior and the inferior wall of the LV. Okay, so this is basal, this is mid, and this is apical. And this is apical cap. So this part will be supplied by your LAD and this part will be supplied by your RCA. And in the long axis view, you will get to see anteroseptal and inferolateral segments of the LV. 
okay and this is at the mid papillary level and as i told you if you see mitral valve this is your basal segment so if you uh, sort of see this five uh, different views you can get a comprehensive idea about all segments of the lv okay so coming to this uh, mid papillary view a classic image there so as you can see there is no regional wall motion abnormality there is very good systolic thickening there okay and you can you you don't appreciate the, the all the segments are contracting quite well in contrast to this if you see as i told you i usually go this way so uh, the anterior segment and the anteroseptal segment as you can see is remarkably hypokinetic if you put an m mode here you can appreciate that even better the inferior segments appear quite okay uh, and the lateral segments are actually contracting very well okay so this patient in all probabilities will have uh, ischemia in the lad territory so uh, in contrast this patient anterior appears quite well septum okay inferior okay but the lateral segments anterolateral and inferolateral all do these two segments appear very hypokinetic same can be seen in this uh, four chamber view which is actually a little foreshortened but still you can appreciate that the lateral segments are not moving well so uh, this patient will have uh, hypokine uh, will have uh, lesion in the circumflex artery this particular patient uh, will ha has got uh, uh, hypokinesia in the inferior segments okay inferior and the inferoseptal segments and as you can see this is at the base of the heart where you are seeing the mitral valve and this is mid papillary view so so uh, you can get a rough idea about the uh, coronary artery lesion uh, in this patient obviously this is in the rca territory but since even the base of the uh, rca territory is having hypokinesia you can say that this patient can have a osteal circumflex lesion so even the basal segments are showing the hypokinesia so if you have got a little bit modern machines which our unit has recently got you can uh, very well do a global longitudinal strain monitoring uh, you can do it in uh, four chamber two chamber and long axis view and you get this bulls eye ready made for you so you don't have to uh, beat around the bush you directly get this image uh, generated by the software and you can see in this case the uh, more the red the, uh, the segments are they appear normal so mostly most likely this patient has got the longitudinal strain of minus 17 which suggests is near normal uh, and there are very few hypokinetic segments here and there so this patient will have will behave nicely in the operating theater and while coming off bypass in contrast if you can see the, here the pale segments the pale segments are in the anterior and the anteroseptal uh, segments uh, even in the inferoseptal segments so this patient has got a severe uh, uh, lesion in the lad territory and you can actually compare this image pre bypass and post bypass or pre and post revascularization and you can confirm that the uh, longitudinal strain improves like it becomes more negative uh, after re complete revascularization and in this particular patient you can see the anterior and septal segments are quite okay they are very well read but the pale segments are in the rca and the circumflex territory okay as i told you you can actually see the improvement in the regional wall motion abnormality as you can see here the lateral segment which was not moving quite well is moving very well after post grafting in this particular patient that's why i told you you should always store the images uh, in the pre bypass or while the surgeon is harvesting the lima in that period you can store and you can compare it with the post grafting period so uh, this particular patient uh, collapsed while shifting from ot table to the bed as you can see the patient has just arrested and we have taken patient again back to the ot table and we are trying to resuscitate this patient by giving adrenaline boluses the surgeon felt that there was issue with the lad graft but looking at this regional wall motion abnormality in the lateral wall you can see the septum uh, the uh, the septal segments are moving quite well and there is torrential mr there and the lateral segments are hardly moving so we told the surgeon most probably this is in the 
OM graft which will have a problem. And when the before opening only, so when the surgeon opened, he clearly noticed that the OM graft was kinked. And uh, we again went on bypass surgeon just revise this OM graft and look at the result. So the lateral segment is moving very well and uh, there is no MR. So you can actually guide surgeon, which uh, so that's what is the importance of the segmental analysis of uh, the LV. So while coming off bypass, you can very well identify that this patient is severely hypovolemic. So this patient in all probabilities will not need any inotropic support. If you just push a little bit of volume, this patient will behave nicely if there is any hemodynamic. Uh, disturbances. Another important use of uh, segmental analysis is a new regional wall motion abnormality. If a patient develops a new regional wall motion abnormality, this particular patient they had got a normal left ventricular function and he developed the new regional wall motion abnormalities in the inferior segments. So uh, most probably we, dis we immediately uh, alerted the surgeon and surgeon told us, okay, while uh, uh, doing in the top end, the patient had the, some air went in the right coronary artery. So this patient, uh, we waited for some time. We just gave a push of uh, phenylephrine and this regional wall motion abnormality immediately disappeared. So this was about the systolic function. The diastolic function is even equally important. It refers to an abnormality of the ventricle to uh, ventricular relaxation, compliance, or filling that results in the requirement of elevated left atrial pressure to achieve a normal LV filling. Okay, so there are comprehensive guidelines available, but as far as busy uh, environment of operation theater is concerned, and we have got very limited time, we can do this simple algorithm which says that the lateral E prime velocity of the mitral annulus we have to measure. If it is more than 10, most probably the patient will have got a normal LV function. If it is less, then we have to see for E by E prime ratio. If it is less than eight, you will have impaired relaxation. If it is between nine to 12, patient will have grade two. And if it is more than 13, the patient will have grade three or the restrictive diastolic dysfunction. So here in this particular patient, you calculate E prime, which is 11. So this patient will have a normal LV diastolic dysfunction, the normal uh, diastolic function. Uh, if, if the E prime is less than 10 and the E by E prime ratio is less than eight, that goes in favor of grade one LV dysfunction, uh, diastolic dysfunction and 12.5 goes in favor of grade two diastolic dysfunction. So we are uh, trying to stage or grade this diastolic dysfunction by why it is so much important. Because in the early phases, the basic physiological change is the impaired relaxation. So if you have got a normal or grade one diastolic function, dysfunction of the heart, uh, left ventricle, then in case of an uh, in case of an hemodynamic disturbance, your first response will be give some fluid because these patients will be preload tolerant. Okay, their LA pressures will be definitely normal and they will be filling time dependent. So you need to basically reduce their tachycardia and the, there will be good hemodynamic uh, improvement in this patient. And you have to always maintain the sinus rhythm or the atrial kick in this particular patients. But as the diastolic function, as the diastolic function dysfunction uh, worsens, this patient slowly will become preload intolerant. Okay, so you will very uh, you will be very very selective in giving fluid to these particular patients with grade two and grade three diastolic dysfunction. But in contrast, they will be afterload tolerant. So you will have a very low threshold of starting in inotropic support for these patients in case there is any hemodynamic disturbance. Their stroke volume will be usually fixed. And you will like to avoid bradycardia in this particular patient. So the reduced compliance, that is grade two and grade three patients will have a high uh, LA pressures and whatever maneuver which increases further LA pressure, you will avoid, you will be a little liberal in giving a uh, diuretic in this uh, advanced diastolic dysfunction patients. So coming to next important thing as ischemic MR, 
as you can see this is not a very uncommon scene uh, during any cabg surgeries nowadays patients will have a severe triple vessel disease and he has got a mitral regurgitation but just looking at a jet is not important you need to quantify it and one of the simplest way ischemic mr particularly i am not discussing all about mr but ischemic mr the simplest test that you can do a uh, do a zoom put a color flow do a zoom uh, on the color uh, on the mitral valve and measure the narrowest part of the uh, jet at the valvular level and here in this case it is 3 mm which indicates a mild mr okay so just looking at the jet is not important you need to do some quantification and vena contracta can be useful in cases where we are we are really uh, in a doubt whether this mr should be addressed or not you need further quantification and that is by doing a uh, pisa for doing pisa measurement you need to drop down on the uh, aliasing velocity here it is 41 Uh, you get a pisa radius you measure the pisa radius that is 6 mm here and you uh, you uh, do a tracing of mr jet and that's how you get an uh, eroa that is uh, effective regurgitant orifice area and if it is more than 4 uh, uh, for 0.4 uh, uh, cm square then usually the mr will be severe and it needs to be addressed like in this case here you don't need any Uh, further sophisticated quantification because as you can see this is an wall hugging eccentric jet which definitely indicates a severe mr and this patient definitely needs his uh, mitral wall either repaired or replaced based on the surgeon experience uh, otherwise it this patient will not come off bypass easily even if he comes off he will have lot of hemodynamic disturbances immediately in the post uh, bypass or icu stay okay so uh, or or in this particular patient again uh, this particular patient had a rupture cord you can see the flail or the uh, flail uh, anterior mitral leaflet there this is actually a rupture cord which was seen here so this patient had got or elderly patient had got a massive mi uh, few days back and it was semi emergency kind of surgery and we noticed this rupture cord and surgeon had to replace this valve because uh, otherwise repair also was feasible but depending on surgeon experience you probably you will have to leave it to the surgeon a bit about rv function the comprehensive assessment may not be possible in all the cases but simplest measurement that you can do is fractional area change which correlates very well with the gold standard of mri derived ejection fraction and a fractional area change above uh, 35% usually will suggest that this is a normal right ventricular function this can be useful because rv dysfunction uh, in the post operative period is very very difficult to manage so quickly assess this by assessing the diastolic and systolic uh, area and you can get an fsc based on this Uh, another uh, very important parameter that we need to assess for the rv is the uh, pulmonary artery pressure estimation as uh, dr kane madam has told that uh, higher pulmonary artery pressures they you will probably need ntg for this patient so commonest way that we can uh, derive this uh, by the tr velocity tricuspid regurgitant velocity and that can be measured by this uh, modified bicable view or the aortic wall short axis view and you get, you put a continuous wave doppler there and you get a regurgitant velocity which a regurgitant flow which is above the baseline and you just major uh, that tr velocity add to it the right atrial pressure which you always have on the monitor nowadays uh, the use of pulmonary artery catheter is reducing a lot so probably uh, probably we can rely on the serial measurements of this pa pressure to guide about the inotrope and ntg strategy for these patients another very important valvular lesion can be aortic regurgitation in this case it is an eccentric aortic regurgitation and aortic regurgitation will have lot of implications in the perioperative period you will not be able to put a balloon pump in this patient you will probably uh, need a retrograde cardioplegia for this patient uh, or on directly osteal cardioplegia for this patient uh, the lv will keep on distending so you need very effective uh, lv venting uh, during surgery so you have to alert both the surgeon and the perfusionist 
to continuously watch for the LV distension when the patient is on cardiopulmonary bypass. Uh, so this is very, very important lesion that you cannot miss. Aortic regurgitation can be very notorious. And if the surgery is prolonged and if you are not giving adequate uh, um, myocardial preservation, there will be a lot of issues while coming off bypass. So there can be an incidental PFO, uh, almost 10 to 15% of the population will have some. In this particular case, it is just a pro-patent PFO, which you can see here. Uh, uh, you need to drop down the Nyquist limit to delineate the flow because these are the low pressure chambers. And these PFOs can be very notorious in the post-operative periods because this patient may have unexplained hypoxemia or uh, maybe they can land up in a stroke uh, because of the uh, embolization risk. So you should document this, you should tell, and you, can, you have to very well alert the ICU team that there is an PFO which is not addressed. So there should not be any uh, air in the IV line. They have to be very, very particular about that. So uh, these patients, the atherosclerotic process may be everywhere, as Madam Carnet told already, uh, that there can be plaques in the descending aorta. Uh, you need to major those. This is a short uh, axis and this is a long axis view uh, of the descending aorta. So some of the plaques can be very dangerous. As in this case, this is a mobile plaque in the arch of aorta. Uh, this is a short axis but still it is at obtained at a 90 degrees, indicating that this is the arch of the aorta and this plaque, which you can see, is just waving you and just waiting to get embolized. So this patient will be at very high risk for post-operative uh, stroke. And we have to alert the surgeon uh, about this finding. So they can be, uh, there can be just a intimal thickening. There can be a uh, plaque which can be less than 5 mm, which is sessile, uh, more than 5 mm goes grade 4. And if it is a mobile, as I had just shown you, um, any plaque which is mobile goes straight away to grade 5 uh, plaques. And these patients will be at very high risk for post operative stroke. There can be LV thrombus. Uh, this can this this may warrant a long term anticoagulation. We may or uh, most in most of the cases there is no need to evacuate this thrombus, but uh, we need to give a very strict anticoagulation. And sometimes you may get confused whether this is a thrombus or a tumor. This particular patient was actually a very young patient who was referred. The MRI also suggested that this is a mobile thrombus. This young lady had a stroke. But looking at this picture, uh, we, were, uh, we were thinking whether this is a uh, myxoma because this is a quite mobile uh, structure attached to the septum. But this is unusual location. But at the end, this turned out to be a rare variant that is LV myxoma. So we have to be sure about and discuss this with the surgeon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak. Uh, Deepak, madam, you are just continuing with your lecture? Or? Yeah, uh, Dr. Bode has to stop shared screen. Yeah, I have just stopped it. You can share screen. You have stopped? Yes, yeah. sir. Okay, I think I... Okay, I was here last. Yeah, that was a beautiful presentation by Dr. Bode, very practical. I'll tell a few more things, the complications that you can have. We already spoke about the LVRV and the diastolic dysfunction, the vasodilatory shock, which uh, may respond to noradrenaline or, uh, or even methyl, uh, methylene blue if required, bleeding, tamponade, a new MI, arrhythmias, AKI, uh, stroke, acute lung injury, all related to the pump, pericardial effusion, pericarditis. Madam, sorry, you have to go into full screen. Just because oh, sorry. No problem. Thank you, madam. Okay. Yeah, yes, ma'am. So uh, you can have arterial conduit spasms also, which will call STT wave changes and regional wall motion abnormalities, as Dr. Bode has already mentioned. And uh, new MI because of poor distal perfusion after grafting, distal embolization of the plaque, technical problems while harvesting, graft occlusion, incorrect anastomosis, 
graft stenosis, spasm, poor distal runoff, and incomplete revascularization. Actually, the surgeon is the best to say what has happened post-op. And uh, coming to early extubation, these are the criteria which we follow, uh, maintaining body temperature, acid base, hemodynamics, stable cardiac rhythm, adequate hemostasis, spontaneous respiratory, tidal volume, inspiratory force, chest x-ray without major abnormalities, adequate urine output, adequate reversal of neuromuscular blocks, alert, awake, cooperative, and moving on limbs, and pain-free patient. Little bit about reduced anatomy, X-ray chest lateral view is important because always there may be uh, no space between the heart and the sternum and uh, the surgeon has to decide how he's opening up or whether he wants a femoral to go on femoral before he opens up the sternum. Or if he opens up straight away, he may go straight into the RV, you should be ready with your fluids and ready with your heparin to go immediately on bypass, perfusionist also should be ready. Little bit about ERAS. Uh, I'll just touch on a few things. Again, in ERAS protocol, this Engelman et al. is a good read. This article, tranexamic acid, periop glycemic control, gold directed fluid therapy, periop opioid sparing, pain management plans, all these are given a lot of importance. Okay, early detection of kidney stress, uh, prehabilitation of patients, insulin regimen for treating hyperglycemia in post op. Uh, in all patients, uh, extubation within six hours of surgery, thromboprophylaxis in the post-operative period, maintaining glycosylated hemoglobin and nutrition also is given importance. And starting with uh, keeping the patients, uh, uh, giving the patients clear fluids up to two to four hours before surgery and oral carbohydrate lo loading to be considered before surgery. Then there's a list, little bit about secondary prevention after CABG. Administer aspirin is administered within six hours after CABG. There is a class one evidence for that. Again, combination of aspirin and clopidogrel for one year is considered in patients without recent acute coronary syndrome. And those with acute coronary syndrome, rasugrel or ticagrel is pre preferred. They are more potent drugs. About warfarin, it's not routinely used after CABG. But in certain indications like atrial fibrillation, venous thromboembolism, or mechanical prosthetic valve, class three indication for its use. The newer drugs, Debigetran, Epixaban, and Rivaroxaban, also routinely not in, in used, but if there is an indication, they will be used. And one more point, if, this, if these drugs are used in the patients preoperatively before surgery, they are stopped three days prior to surgery. Statins to be continued in the post-operative period as fast as possible. Even beta blockers continued as fast as possible and they seem to reduce the risk of post-op AFib. Only in patients with low AF, they may be titrated. AC inhibitors also to be continued in the post-op period. Again, they have to be titrated with the creatinine clearance of the patient. That has to be taken care of. Mid-cap, just what is mid-cap and what is T-cap? It is Lima takedown and anastomosis to LAD can be done on pump or off pump. And totally endoscopic coronary revascularization, that is TCAP, again, it can be done with or without CT bypass. Now, what is presently, what are we following and what is the future like? See, if we look about, talk about, just to summarize, the volatile anesthetics 2017 guidelines, uh, the European Society suggested volatile anesthetic agents for myocardial protection. Whereas the latest trial, the Myriad trial, did not confirm favorable effects. So what is the future? The future may be that the recommendations about volatile anesthetics may be downgraded in the future guidelines. About xenon, it is useful for hemodynamic stability and may be associated with some degree of myocardial and cerebral protection. However, high costs need for a dedicated anesthesia machine and availability is the issue. About opioids, from high doses, they have come to low, moderate doses. They remain the, now the cornerstone of cardiac anesthesia. Future, what do we expect? We are expecting an opioid-free anesthesia with peripheral nerve blocks and minimally invasive cardiac surgery. About neuromuscular blocks, intermediate acting neuromuscular blocks are administered at present, but about future, there are uh, future uh, RCT should address doing cases even without neuromuscular blocking drugs. Dexmeditomidine, intraoperative administration of dexmeditomidine has been suggested to exert cerebral and renal protection, and this requires further research. 
intraop mechanical ventilation, that is when the patient is on a pump. Uh, there is no consensus right now. There are three ongoing trials, which I already mentioned. About regional anesthesia techniques, neuraxial anesthesia, the adjunct to general anesthesia, that is what currently we are saying. The possible area of future investigation could be effective on outcomes of peripheral nerve blocks, that is the erector spinae block, uh, as, along with opioid free or opioid sparing approaches and with minimally invasive cardiac surgery techniques or more generally in the context of ERAS protocols. Little bit about handoffs. Handoffs is very important. That is giving handover. Now the patient can come from CABG if it is elective, he'll come from the floor to your OT. Sometimes it's an emergency from cath lab, the patient is pushed to the cardiac OT. So giving handover is very important from one anesthetist to the other. So the critical needs of the patient, the ventilation of the patient, bleeding if it has occurred, what monitoring is going on, what are the hemodynamics of the patient, what anesthetics are used in the patient. All these parameters have to be told to the anesthetist you're giving handover. And CABG being a very long procedure or any bypass case, if uh, intraoperatively you want your tea break or lunch break, again, be very careful about these handoffs. Again, postoperatively, when the patient goes back to the ICU, whoever is taking care of the patient in the ICU should be given all these handoffs. So these are my references, main, main is Kaplan and uh, from up to date and some from the Journal of Cardiovascular Thoracic uh, uh, Anesthesia. Uh, this, these two articles are really good, low cardiac output syndrome of the cardiac surgery and in, impact of anesthetic regimen on outcomes in adult cardiac surgery. Thank you and stay healthy, stay safe. Thank you and thank you for giving your time on a Sunday morning. Thank you, madam. Uh, I think thank you, uh, madam, and thank you, Deepak. I think so. Thank you, madam, because uh, most of us we are all doing cases uh, on pump, and but something which and we're doing it routine. But thank you for giving information which is not there in the textbook. Thank you for that because you have given us a lot of evidence based medicine and articles which we. I'm sure that uh, the students must be knowing all this, but uh, the routine which information which is given in books. But what you have given us is something which is not given in textbooks with all the evidence based with all the randomized controlled trials and you have told us everything. I now request uh, Kalpana Shah, madam, uh, to give her viewpoint, her experience because she has almost over 30 years of experience. So I like to, she would, I would like her to share her viewpoint. Kalpana, madam. Hi. Uh... Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> Dr. Deepa, on the onset, let me say, uh, I think it was a wonderful, luminous, and a very lucid presentation, which, uh, of course, all of our students will really enjoy that. And they would have learned a lot from this. Beyond the textbook, you have even put in a lot of references, which Dr. Prasanna also just mentioned. And to top it all, Dr. Uh, Dr. Deepa, a very humble presentation, but with lovely uh, pictures. And I'm sure you had a very wide variety of cases, which I'm sure none of us have seen, but excellent work both of you have done and made it very precise. I just wanted to add one or two things, as Dr. Deepa rightly said, that uh, uh, you should always have a communication with your uh, surgical colleagues and, and especially so I would like to just say, uh, tell the newer uh, uh, budding cardiac anesthesiologist that always see your preoperative angio. Whenever you are doing it, make it a point to see preoperative angio. And once uh, when I was doing this, one of a very senior uh, a surgeon who had come from a workshop from New York, he told me some points which I thought I would like to share, which I'm sure would be a very helpful caveat. Apart from all these preoperative uh, uh, things that we see, LV, EDP, and you know, all these things, diabetic comorbidities, he told me other four points. He said that, look at the vessels. If your vessels are good size with a good timi 3 flow, but of course they have some blockages or distal blockages and your ejection fraction is good, that patient will definitely do well. If you again have a patient with good vessel and a bad ejection fraction, then of course your inotropes will help you tide over the crisis till your revask is being done. The, the, the worst thing is the patients who have got you know, small vessel disease, typically that you see in your diabetic patients with a very bad distal runoff, you know, like a zero or a kidney two flow. And these patients who have got low ejection fraction, again, are a red flag for anesthesiologists and of course for the surgical team. But again, if the small vessels are there with a good ejection fraction and if you have given them a good revas, then these patients will generally do well. So this was a, just a bit of a caveat to 
to add your risk factors to understand how you are going to go ahead post operatively in managing your uh, uh, your patients apart from that i think uh, prehabilitation is very important so in the uh, a beautiful slide with deepa had put in it's a team effort i would like to even put in a physiotherapist over there because now that we are going in for fast tracking and ultra fast tracking it's very very important that you should and have a physical and a nutri a nutri dietitian also then <laughs> exactly so that's also one of the very yeah. uh, nice thing yes. and i really don't know whether, whether this is relevant but uh, i think some of our patients who have been a redo patients or those with uh, bad left ventricular systolic function and uh, uh, with a, 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 we have, who have been very much dilated and we have taken them up so these patients we've also used vacuum assisted uh, venous drainage and that has kind of help us to tide over because apart from low priming volume and other things it did help us in uh, managing these patients a little better these were just a few points which i could randomly think of but otherwise uh, dr prasanna have fantastically conducted just one point people like deepa bode with us i think we, maybe we can have an educational series also on uh, echoes you know taken it one by one that will be a wonderful thing for I, all of us i have just messaged the same thing i have just echoed your thing in fact i am going to take full advantage of deepa bode now so thank you yes. I'll, i no it's it's all my all my privilege thank you very much in fact i just messaged uh, this deepa uh, can be this... part of every educational series Yes, yes. <laughs> so I just wanted to couple up. Deepak, I wanted to know about something like the epiotic probing, like probe, like for this. Uh, this. Yes, epiotic for... probes are available, but unfortunately, I have no experience in that. Probably, uh, if Amish is in audience, Amish has got Amish Jaspara. He has got some experience in epicardial. Probing. Amish is there. Amish is there. I think so. If he can, if he can comment, I have basically no experience because. and also i wanted to ask uh, initially uh, uday sir is also there if he can say that uh, they some people when they used to uh, have radial graft as a conduit radial uh, conduit they used to start uh, people start nicoran but now it is not used means is it used it is not used and it has gone is it gone vague so i just wanted to ask sir and what is the, uh, this if anybody if do you also can ask or whatever so our surgical team also nowadays are uh, harvesting radial arteries quite frequently uh, mostly for young patients uh, who are diabetic so we have got lot of young patients who are diabetic where we can't consider bilateral ima so those patients will definitely get benefited by arterial revascularization and probably as the surgical team evolves in harvesting the radial artery and their experience as it uh, evolves probably we don't need much of a, we don't probably need much of drugs to you know prevent the spasm it is more has to do with the harvesting and how the surgeon handles it probably uday sir can guide more on this Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, excellent presentation, fantastic uh, morning presentations, both Deepa and uh, Deepa. The uh, about the radial artery graft, yes, we do in all our patients radial graft. Uh, as long as the radial artery uh, preoperatively uh, doesn't have calcification, and yes, uh, I, the more radial, the more arterial graft you have in the patient. it is better to have a uh, drug going like nicorandil or any other calcium channel blocker so uh, we do use specially in the post op period because these are the drugs which are very very prone for spasm post operative so yes nicorandil uh, definitely has a role and should be used in uh, uh, mostly when you are using arterial graft along with uh, other ntg and other thank you sir uh, madam uh, uh, kalpana sha madam can you uh, also tell us that your this about that lma i think so people will be really interested in uh, knowing about your this the lma which you have used for uh, uh, yeah uh well uh, we started using prosil lma in we started off with just maybe a single graft or a graft anterior graft maybe a lady with diagonal lima led diagonal and uh, i use mainly prosil lma because it can be reused and i found that the cuff pressures were better maintained uh, a, 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 a low pressure high volume cuff and of course i had a dlt uh, tube inside so i could even put in a rice tube uh, this started off as a just a discussion with uh, some of my anesthesia colleagues mainly with dr uh, navan shastri and we started this and then we went ahead and did it with uh, 
other cases started off with posterior grafts and lateral grafts and we could manage it of course we did have to do a lot of uh, manipulation as well as surgical manipulations were required like the rima retractor you know the long end of the rima retractor if it comes and hits over here of the patient then the the uh, the lma would get displaced so we had to uh, make another uh, sternal retractor where the the long end of the retractor was more on the left side so these were the thing mainly for ultra fast tracking and fast tracking and i found that it was really helpful in uh, fast tracking these patients the sympathetic response which was much less uh, like when you are intubating so the sympathetic response i don't think i have used the beta blocker in the last couple of years of my practice of course we have dexmedomidine as well with us and uh, we've been successfully doing it of course during the corona time we did stop it but now we've restarted using laryngeal mask yet your audio is off uh, prasanna amish is there so amish can you share your experience now on uh, since deepak has said that you do a lot of ap aortic scanning oh, so we scan. are yeah can you hear me yeah 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 so we have not done lot of ap aortic scanning but in patients where we find a lot of plaques in descending aorta that uh, like type 5 types uh, 4 type 5 plaques in those cases it is always uh, it is always better to get a ap aortic done because uh, because the proximal anastomosis unless it is a lima rima y or lima radial y and many of our surgeons are doing lima vein or lima means there are proximal anastomosis so it is always better what we do is uh, we uh, to to the uh, we have tried even with the tte probe and we have tried even with the linear probe the problem with the tte probe is the near field clutter so to prevent that what we do we take a bag full of uh, uh, a glove full of saline keep it on the heart and uh, put the probe on that so that you, you know you can see the full aorta the full circumferential aorta identify the spots where there are plaques of course the surgeon can also digitally do it uh, identify the plaques the spot the spots where there are plaques and avoid these regions for proximal anastomosis now it is very at times it is very difficult to convince the surgeon to allow us to do all these things but uh, till now twice or thrice we have managed to do it and we have got good pictures also i mean it helps a lot so only in cases where there are you know very too much of plaques in uh, descending aorta or you find in arch if you put in the te and you find plaques in the arch also then it will be definitely advisable to do a um ap aortic scan but uh, maintaining the sterile uh, precautions while putting in the probe can be really difficult and it difficult. can be challenging you need probably so you what, can get so, a laparoscopy, so what, laparoscopy uh, instruments they have got those sheets so probably you can yeah, put exactly. in your so, uh, so we have a camera cover we use the camera cover and uh, uh, the on end of the camera we have the camera sterile camera cover with us the anesthetist at the head end uh, puts the jelly on the probe and directs it directs in the in the camera cover and then we pull it out so that helps and we have sterile rubber band so with that we attach it and do the scanning but ap aortic and epicardial and once you have done ap aortic then it is always better at the same time to do an epicardial scanning also because it it epicardial scanning also has some 6 to 7 views which can be easily obtained and it doesn't take much time so this does uh, does help the surgeon in replanning his uh, conduit placement yeah. am i right so yeah. so twice yes and uh, twice we have faced uh, this this was during the during this time uh, during the, during the covid times we had two emergency cavgs in span of two uh, one to two months and then after the revascularization it was done off pump the patient had sct changes there were no hemodynamic changes but patient had lot of sct changes and we didn't put te because of the covid contamination issues so in these cases we did an epicardial echo and we, what we found is that when we did an epicardial echo the wall contractility of all the six segments at all three levels was absolutely normal so we just ignored those sct abnormalities and the next day it reverted back to the norm so probably there was some air or something 
which had caused those temporary disturbances. And I found that, of course, the apical view is not there in uh, epicardial echo, it's not a standard view. But once you take the probe very down towards the apex of the heart, you can easily see the apex also. And for epicardial echo, the near, near field clutter is not as, as much as it is for apiotic scanning. About uh, apiotic scanning, uh, Kalpana, you said it is for proximal. Mainly, I feel it is more for aortic cannulation because that's a big cannula. And if you have a calcium plaque sitting right there, you definitely have some neuro complications. So I think you should have a look at free of X-ray. If you see uh, obvious calcification there, I think that is the patient where you should be doing or those patients who already have history of TIs in the past. So I think those are the patients where you should be doing uh, regular epiotic uh, uh, Deepak, uh, uh, Sanjani Madam wants to know ki what is the differentiate, how would you differentiate myocardial stunning and regional wall motion abnormalities? It can be, it can be very challenging uh, to, to differentiate between the two and particularly when uh, while, while coming off bypass or when the surgeon is also handling the heart, there is a lot of movement happening there. So it can be, it can be really very challenging to differentiate and most probably uh, as far as when you are doing a transesophageal echo, when you are echocardiographer, you should not forget that you are also an anesthetist. You have to look after the patient as far as the anesthesia part is concerned and hemodynamic and you are, you are a physician as well so you have to tackle the hemodynamic part also so one can be a very excellent or extraordinary echocardiographer but you if you neglect the patient the outcome will not be good probably that is what i can think of because as far as my experience is concerned we are most of the cases we are all alone or at the most we get one help that may that may also not be all throughout the case so you have to be multitasking so probably uh, the thing which you can uh, which the surgeon can fix if you can tell that particular finding to the surgeon then it will improve even your uh, utility of the transit of echo thank you so thank you i just that uh, deepa madam had said about that uh, just want to comment is that deepa madam had said about the the, uh, there's a bypass checklist that is a pre-bypass, bypass, when we go on bypass and there's a post-bypass checklist. So I think so even I, it's not that I think so all these, it is mostly for students, but even like even I, uh, say I we had this typical checklist when I did my uh, cardiac anesthesia from Bangalore, from Narayan Udale, and Murlidhar sir was there and we had this checklist and we had laminated it and kept it in the, and kept it at the uh, Machine. Yeah, so the, the same thing. <laughs> so the same thing. I had done it even when I came back to when in my hospital, I had kept three checklists and I had laminated. So I think so. It is very useful for students. In fact, if I, even for us, like so that we don't miss any point when we are going on by you know on bypass when we are on bypass. What is the checklist? And we are when we are coming off bypass. So I think so that. Brings so, back good memories of Narayana. I had been to Narayana when Prasanna was a fellow there <laughs> in two thousand and two. Uh, like I. Had, uh, was it uh, Narayana for about a week just to see how they are doing things and uh, Dr. Deepak I also want to tell you what I noticed there about the inotropes you know that time TE they were not using in all the patients but what I saw was they were using a different combination of inotropes for CABGs uh, and uh, all their patients were doing very well so, <laughs> so I used to really wonder, you know, the different combinations. I have seen them use even isoprenaline in those days while coming off. So that is not to be mentioned, but I'm just saying. So, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, madam. Thank you, Deepa, madam, for that wonderful uh, presentation. I, I'm sure all the students will have uh, really the uh, extra whatever the evidence meds, uh, based medicine. Uh, would have really helped them to conduct these cases much better. And uh, Deepak, thank you. Thank I think you. Thank I'm going to trouble you more now <laughs> for <laughs> academic activities. And Kalpana, madam, thank you for your, you know, your inputs, your vast experiences. Definitely, you know, it's it's really good to have all these small caveats from uh, you. So I once again take this opportunity and Acta Mumbai thanks all of you for this wonderful uh, this. Thank you all of you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Bye bye. Yeah. Yeah. You can end it.